Okay, cool. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the 28th Scala Buff. Uh, after short break caused by conferences, two cool conferences that we had in also, and uh, also some other issues. Uh, but we are back on track with our meetups. I hope that you are as excited as I am. Uh, so these meetups wouldn't happen without the help of our sponsors, uh, iterators and Sumologic. Please uh, give them a warm round of applause. Okay, commercial break is over. So uh, one thing before we start, remember there are beers in that fridge and fridge over there. Uh, it's important to stay hydrated, especially in this lovely, maybe not that lovely, but this weather. Uh, yeah, we, we're gonna have two presentation. After the first presentation, we, there will be like a short break or longer break with uh, pizza and beers and networking. So and enjoy, and then we have another presentation, and after that we'll be heading to Vaga Pivo for usual after party. So uh, to hi stay hydrated even more. Uh, so so that's that's it. Uh, as for introduction, so the first presentation uh, by Michal will be uh, talking about concurrency in Scala. Uh, this is fresh talk, as I heard. So uh, I, I hope that you will enjoy it. And yeah, warm welcome, Michal. Right, thank you, Lukas, for this introduction. Um, welcome to my presentation. We'll be talking about uh, concurrency in Scala, uh, a little bit about logs, about uh, STM, also a little bit about uh, effect systems. Um, about me, my name is Michal, and um, I've been working with Scala for the past three to four years. Um, around, I would say, half of that time I've been using um, CADS Effect. Right now I uh, work for Evolution Engineering where we uh, build, um, right now, mostly real-time event-driven systems with CADS Effect, among others, also with uh, functional streams and stuff. So yeah. The plan uh, for today is to take a look at mostly how to deal with shared state on the JVM and in functional Scala. The plan is in the first part of the presentation to uh, take a look at the basics to understand uh, them better. Uh, by basics, I mean how uh, the shared state is handled in a uh, thread safe way on the JVM using very low level primitives such as synchronized, uh, also atomic variables, uh, among others to understand uh, better what problems we are trying to solve. Uh, after that, we'll take a quick look about um, how it's done in uh, effect systems. And finally, we will introduce software transactional memory as an ultimate solution to threat safety, uh, which is awesome, <laughs> you will see. Okay, let's get started. Um, to start with, as soon as we have our JVM application, which has some shared state, such as variable, data structure, whatever, and we introduce more than one thread there, which happens all the time because this is like, oh my God, that's what JVM is usually designed to do, uh, we face a lot of challenges which are not um, at all solved uh, by default. The first challenge is the problem with uh, visibility. And um, it stems from the fact that every thread uh, doesn't operate on the shared state directly. It operates on uh, its own copy of the state, which lives on different CPU layers. We have this L1 through L3 caches all, all the way down to the main uh, memory. So uh, when the write to the shared memory happens from perspective of one thread, uh, it's not instantly visible by other threads. And uh, to solve this problem, we need to use either a uh, volatile uh, variable modifier or synchronized statement is um, enough. Another problem are uh, compiler and uh, CPU optimizations, specifically uh, reorderings. Uh, that problem is also solved just by using volatile or synchronized. And the third one, uh, one of the most interesting problems in computer science, I think, uh, at least in concurrency, is uh, race conditions. Uh, yeah, really overused term, but uh, like I noticed that uh, we developers really like to use uh, like this, this term to <laughs> describe what, what happens in real life, for example. But in, in general, like what, what happens is um, when multiple threads are accessing uh, the same resource, 
it's important in which order they are um, accessing it. And uh, yeah, this is um, the, the summary of race condition problem. And it's solved by synchronized, but uh, volatile itself is not enough. We need a compare and swap uh, processor instruction to uh, solve it. Um, in here I have um, a couple of definitions. Uh, we will rephrase race condition a little bit. It is a situation when output of concurrent program uh, is non-deterministic. Every time we run it, we, we can end up with a different result. And um, yeah, this uh, result of a program depends on the execution schedule of uh, the threads of how exactly they are interleaving uh, each other. Critical section, uh, it's just a piece of code that uh, is expected to be modified by multiple threads. And uh, thread safety, uh, what we are trying to achieve is when code or data structure is free from race conditions in multi-threaded program. Uh, we have a couple of different examples of uh, race uh, conditions. Uh, first one is read modify um, write uh, problem. Uh, the simplest example is just uh, variable incrementation uh, because it's not one but uh, three different operations that we need to uh, make to increment the variable. First we need to read from memory location the current state, then we need to calculate the next uh, value and then also in the third step write it back uh, to this um, memory. Uh, yeah, of course, providing that, provided that we are not incrementing in like functional immutable way, but just like this using variable. And uh, we are ending up with uh, lost update problem, uh, otherwise known as write write problem, uh, when uh, we are doing it at the same time by uh, multiple threads um, at the time. And uh, it's a situation in which one update is overwritten by updates performed by another uh, thread. Another example of race condition is uh, check the NACT, which is a situation in which a thread um, uses shared state to decide about what to do next. And you can imagine that uh, if you have multiple threads that will decide on the current memory uh, state, um, then uh, they can proceed and perform some more writes on this uh, shared memory and uh, we might uh, end up with uh, the type of bugs that are called time of check to time of use um, bugs, uh, which is also bad. Um, what do we do on the JVM to make sure that um, race conditions don't um, happen? We can go with pessimistic or optimistic approach. P pessimistic one um, is just about threads acquiring an exclusive block before entering critical section then the thread does its own thing, modifies that state, and uh, after that it releases the lock and uh, other threads from the waiting queue. If they are like, waiting for this lock, they can only acquire it um, at this moment. Optimistic approach is uh, assuming that the conflict won't happen at all. There are no conflicts, but we have some mechanism that will allow us to detect such conflict. And if it's detected, uh, we are expected to um, retry. Yeah. So how pessimistic locking uh, is implemented on the JVM? Let's recap. We can use synchronized, probably most like low level um, synchronization primitive on the JVM. There are a couple of problems with it. It doesn't support fairness, uh, which means we can end up uh, in a thread starvation scenario with, where like one or more threads, they cannot enter the critical section and uh, perform their own thing. Uh, also, the problem is that uh, when thread is blocked, when it uh, cannot get the access to the lock, and uh, this blocked thread uh, cannot be interrupted. And uh, Java locks API um, improves on it a little bit because um, it introduces fairness parameter that can be used to introduce some more fairness. Um, we have try lock, which means uh, we'll try to acquire the lock, but uh, uh, we will back off if it's not available at the moment. We can also lock interruptibly, uh, which means that uh, thread that is waiting for the lock will be, will be able to um, interrupt it. There's one important decision that we need to make when we are acquiring this pessimistic lock. We need to decide whether we want it to be coarse grained or fine grained. So yeah, there are a lot of things to uh, think about when we are using such low level API. 
And uh, coarse grained is just having one log per possibly multiple objects. The problem here is um, the contention because um, a lot of threads will be competing over acquiring the same research, which basically defeats the purpose of concurrency doing things uh, simultaneously. Fine grained log is great. Um, it's uh, a bit more work to um, get such thing done because we need to acquire those logs per object. And uh, the problem is that we might end up with uh, deadlock um, very easily if we are not careful because we need to acquire those logs in the right order. Uh, one of the most overused uh, examples when speaking of uh, mm, concurrency, especially shared state, uh, in every like book example, uh, you'll have the example with bank accounts, uh, but with reason, <laughs> yeah, because it's uh, it's probably the best example to show this kind of uh, stuff. Here we have a transfer that happens between uh, source bank account and uh, target to uh, bank account. The critical section is the, the method body. And uh, what we can see there is a race condition, specifically read, modify, write race condition on both of um, the variables. And uh, what we need to do to um, make this critical section thread safe is just up it uh, in uh, synchronized, which is obviously wrong because uh, we are synchronizing uh, on the reference to this. We basically can only run one transfer at the same time, even if you have thousand uh, bank accounts, only one pair of them will be able to be run uh, at the moment, which still defeats the purpose of concurrency on like every possible level. And uh, fine-grained log would look like this, which is uh, acquired the monitors of like, specific uh, objects, specific bank accounts. We synchronize on uh, the source and the target uh, bank accounts. And of course, the problem is still, we need to think hard about making this uh, like work uh, right. Uh, because in a situation when we transfer from A to B and at the same time from B to A, the yeah, locks will be acquired in such an order that we can end up with a deadlock. And to do that, um, yeah, this is the final solution that uh, finally works. And uh, yeah, just take a look how, <laughs> uh, how terrible it is. Uh, we need to introduce some ordering between those uh, bank account. So we implement a field ID and uh, based on that we always make sure to acquire locks uh, in the right order. Uh, so yeah, we'll come to that later about how to do that stuff. Uh, but um, do we have um, anything similar to the um, in the effect systems like uh, for example in the cas effect? Uh, in here we are, of course, dealing with uh, JVM uh, threads, but in the effect systems we are dealing with something one level higher in terms of abstraction because we are dealing with fibers which are running um, on top of JVM thread pools. So, for example, one fiber, it can run at different points uh, in time on different threads because, uh, for example, if it goes to sleep, it's only semantically blocked and uh, it can, for example, resume its execution um, on a different JVM thread. So we need to introduce some uh, like totally new solution and uh, like in the effect systems, uh, we have usually something like a mutex or just something like exactly the same, which is like semaphore with one uh, permit. The problem is that, uh, for example, in CAS effect, it's uh, not that easy to implement uh, reentrancy at uh, the moment because it basically implies introducing, like keeping tra track of like uh, every particular fiber's ID. Uh, but yeah, there is, um, for example, something like this. Uh, from what I remember, Zio has re-entrant uh, lock even. So yeah, we can um, also lock in a pessimistic way in, uh, in the cuts effect world. Um, okay, to sum up the pessimistic locking topic, uh, yeah, it's probably not the best uh, default approach towards uh, making our shared state in concurrent program um, thread safe, but it's still very useful in high contention uh, scenario when like a lot of threads are modifying uh, the shared state at the same time. Um, but yeah, optimistic locking, uh, it seems like much better alternative. I like suppose that uh, uh, if you work on JVM, even with uh, Scala, you like for sure are using um, atomic variables all the time. 
so this is what you want to probably use by default and um, yeah, on the JVM it's implemented with um, atomic variables and under the hood those atomic variables are using uh, volatile keywords. Uh, remember to solve those problems with um, compiler and CPU reorderings and also uh, with uh, those um, writes um, for them to be happening directly to the main memory, skipping those CPU cache layers. Uh, but yeah, it's not enough. We also need compare and uh, swap. And here's the example of how we can implement our own update with retries. Uh, yeah, it belongs to the API of Atomic Reference, but uh, in here we can just see better what we are using, like uh, probably very, very often in our code. And here um, we are uh, introducing um, a helper method, try update, which will be running recursively. And uh, yeah, normally uh, it would look um, a bit like a read, modify, write, brace condition. Uh, because we are reading uh, from the state, we're calculating a new value and then we are writing it back. Despite the fact that here we are not simply writing it back, we are using this comparant set API that checks uh, whether any other write didn't happen along the way. So uh, this is uh, this our um, conflict detection that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. So um, compare and set how it works, it will just return false uh, if there was a conflict and if we didn't uh, manage to set a new value, then we'll be just able to recursively uh, retry. But if it worked out, it just returns true and we exit uh, the recursive course. And uh, yeah, unlike um, synchronized, in the effect systems, we use atomic reference as well. The only difference is that it's just referentially transparent, fully functional, uh, because uh, it's like every operation, every side effect, such as creating a atomic reference, updating it, reading it, everything is wrapped uh, within uh, an IO monad. So everything is purely functional, but at the same time, we are still using this um, atomic reference. And uh, yeah, about uh, API, um, how um, derived from CAS effect and probably similarly in uh, any other effect systems look like, we can just um, update, try update once, and uh, if conflict happened, uh, we will just get a Boolean flag, for example, false if it didn't work out, or um, yeah, true um, if it uh, was uh, successful, but we will not retry by default. Uh, the retries will happen, so we'll have this retry um, loop. And uh, we also have uh, an access to a more low-level low access API, which is actually really uh, nice to understand uh, like what's uh, happening under the hood. And for example, to um, implement some logs and uh, to see, for example, like on a like living body, um, how those retries uh, work when we are trying to modify the mm, shared state. And what access returns? Uh, it returns a uh, tuple uh, wrapped within uh, an IO monad. One thing is uh, it's marked as pref. It's a snapshot of uh, current memory state. And it also returns a setter method. Setter method uh, like works pretty much the same as uh, compare and swap. So in this example, after checking whether the balance of the bank account is uh, enough to withdraw the amount, we use the setter to set a new updated uh, state. And the uh, setter, um, like also again in a monadic referentially transparent way, will return um, to us a true if um, the update happened uh, successfully, we can log it uh, for the better visibility of this example or it uh, will return false if uh, the update didn't uh, succeed. In such case, we can also here decide to log that uh, it didn't succeed and also um, yeah, run this update uh, recursively. So it's basically the same method that we saw uh, before about how to implement the update with retries, but in a fully functional way. Um, to sum up optimistic locking, like it's much better for sure than uh, just using pessimistic locks. Uh, it provides us like 
most importantly with deadlock and starvation freedom. But uh, it's, uh, it behaves uh, the best in low contention scenario when we don't have that many threads competing over the same shared resource. And also when the retries are not that expensive. Um, so yeah, but there are some problems with um, atomic uh, variables. One of the problems is that, um, yeah, one update is atomic, but multiple operations, uh, they are not. And we could argue that we can just put a lot of different objects within one atomic variable, but yeah, it's just not the right way to do this. Uh, another problem is that, yeah, when the contention is high, we will just end up with um, like huge amount of retries and it will be totally in performance. So those are the problems that uh, we are trying uh, to solve on our journey to finding the best way to handle um, shared state in concurrent applications. Uh, so to illustrate the problem better, here we have um, a, an example of um, transfer method that transfer, uh, that uses um, like breath uh, from cat's effect mm, for um, to store like the amount of, uh, to store the bank accounts and to, and here we are just performing the transfer between them. So we have the withdraw operation to withdraw the money and deposit. And let's assume that they are both atomic and thread safe. So um, what's happening there? There are two problems uh, at least. One problem is that um, we are ending up with an inconsistent state uh, between those operations because we want the amount to either be in one bank account or in another bank account. But in between those operations, it's in neither of them. Another problem is that what if withdrawal succeeds and deposit fails? Uh, we don't have any rollback or anything like that. We would probably need to perform some checks or like whatever, or just use locks. <laughs> um, yeah, so here we are introducing uh, something new, which is uh, transactional memory. It's um, an in-memory analogy to database transactions. Uh, it's used as an alternative to low-level thread synchronization and it improves on uh, optimistic approach towards uh, mm, like making our concurrent program spread safe a lot. What it does, it just ensures safe access to shared memory and uh, it um, equips us with deadlock freedom and starvation freedom. And it also makes much more as you will see in a while. So you might be familiar with uh, famous ACID uh, properties of uh, database transactions. Uh, transactional memory is supposed to fulfill, uh, yeah, part of them, uh, everyone besides durability. Yeah, atomicity is just like uh, the property that says that if we have the transaction, it needs to be um, run either fully or not at all. Uh, yeah, about consistency, it's about uh, invariance of our state. So we don't want a situation like we had with this uh, bank account um, transfer when like in between withdrawal and deposit we have uh, inconsistent state. Also isolation, uh, probably uh, one of the most important um, properties here is that we want our transactions to run in isolation, which means uh, they are not interfering with each other. They do not see each other's partial updates. And it seems from the outside like they are happening one after another. Uh, durability, property of the database transactions uh, doesn't hold here. This property means that um, even if a system failure occurs, then the result of successful transaction it um, holds. Uh, but it of course doesn't uh, work with in-memory transaction because if the system fails, it just fails. <laughs> we can do nothing about it. Uh, so we are looking for the semantics uh, in our software transactional memory API that looks more or less like this. We want to be able to list the transactions one after another, just compose them, make bigger transactions out of uh, smaller ones. And uh, we need um, an API, here it's called commit. It's work, it looks the same in CASSTM, for example. And it will just say that, okay, take this one transaction and uh, just run it in isolation. And uh, yeah, commit starts memory transaction. So yeah, this is what uh, we are looking for. And uh, 
Uh, yeah, here we are talking about op optimistic STMs. From what I was, um, what I heard is that you can implement STM also in a uh, pessimistic way. But uh, from what I saw, like most uh, mm, APIs that are being used, they're implemented in an optimistic way. I think I have an answer to that because yeah, you're so that in most uh, scenarios, logs are just very problematic and uh, in concurrency, we just uh, tends, we just want to go with optimistic approach because it's uh, almost uh, guaranteed to be much better in most scenarios. So more or less uh, how we want this STM to work. Uh, we want this commit statement to maintain some log of read and write operations in the volatile memory. Uh, it won't be yet in the uh, committed memory. And at the end of uh, this commit block, we want those uh, writes from a volatile memory to be committed, uh, saved uh, in a like main memory. And uh, when transactional conflict happens, the transaction is rolled back. Uh, yeah, so this um, log is invalidated. And we are saying that transaction is completed if it was committed or rolled back and re-executed, which is a recursive statement because this rolling back and re-executing like we want it to be happening all over again until the transaction is committed. Um, and in Scala ecosystem, we have uh, at least a couple of options to choose from. Uh, for example, we have Scala STM that can be used with just vanilla Scala and futures. And uh, in the effect systems, um, I took a look at uh, CATS STM because I use CATS, so it's uh, it's more familiar to me, uh, the stuff. And uh, there is also Zio STM, which like seems quite fantastic. There are like much, even like much more uh, APIs that can be used than in CATS um, STM. So um, in CATS STM and also probably the same in um, Zio STM, how it works is that um, we cannot mix our transactions with the effects. And the reason for that is that we need a way to roll the transaction back. And if we had effects there, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that. So transactions can only be composed with other transactions uh, and with pure computations. Uh, implementation, but there was still some retries happening. So I suppose it's not that uh, it like runs totally nice, like uh, one at a time, but uh, like this program was quite performant. But when I set this concurrency factor to more, like five, six, even 10, allowing many more transactions to be happening at the same time. Uh, there were a lot of retries, uh, like sometimes five or six uh, at the time uh, to just perform one subtraction from this uh, bank account. And uh, it ran much longer. I mean, uh, with concurrency factor one, it ran like way quicker than one second, but with like six or even more, it was like, six seconds at, uh, at least. So, but like, still it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, you can actually use it because just with compare and swap instruction, it's not possible to do stuff like this. You would need to use the locks. And uh, yeah, I mean, transactional variable is in the center of this uh, API and those like runtime operations like abort, retry, uh, but there are some convenience wrappers, let's say. They're all implemented with uh, transactional variable. Yeah, yes, please, there's a question. No, it just uses uh, CATS effect uh, runtime, which is, yeah, as you are saying, you have just like number of uh, threads. They depend on like underlying CPU of the machine that you run it with and uh, STM. I think it only, at least CATS STM, it only provides this concurrency factor. Uh, no, so STM um, runtime is actually we just need to, it uses normal IO up. 
Yeah, but uh, as in here, you just need to um, instantiate something like this, STM. Actually, it takes uh, this concurrency factor, but in here, I'm just using default parameter, which is, uh, which is four. But Mm, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't see any M beans, for example, uh, or stuff like that that is being exposed by that. Um, maybe Zaya STM has something like this. I think that maybe it could be possible to, uh, like, what I was doing, I was just, um, I wasn't doing, the, uh, I wasn't using, first of all, the stuff in production, just like for my own experiment. So, what I did, I was just using print line to basically more or less see how many retries are happening in uh, whatever scenario uh, it is. But uh, yeah, maybe that's something to contribute to, to the library. <laughs> that would be that would be useful, actually. Yeah, it's uh, actually in in Cas Effect. Not I think not that many people know about those um, mbins that are exposed uh, via runtime. But uh, it's interesting uh, how how nice uh, information they they expose about uh, I mean the fiber snapshot, for, for example, stuff like that. Um, yeah, to sum up, those are just uh, convenience wrappers um, that are implemented using this transactional variable under the hood. Uh, in Zio STM, actually, the implementation, I think, is a bit more rich. It uh, exposes a couple of more different data structure. But yeah, we have TMVAR that is basically like uh, deferred. So uh, we have a container that can be filled, but in this case, it can also be emptied. And uh, it's just an option with transactional variable under the hood. We can also use transactional semaphore, uh, which has like the same API as uh, normal effectful semaphore, but um, mm, it runs in transactional way. And also we have transactional queue that uh, is basically implemented with um, immutable Scala queue under the hood. Um, yeah, that's mostly it from me. Thank you very much. Uh, here is the link to the presentation if you want to get back to it and uh, if you want to connect, you can find me here. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions maybe because we hmm. Yeah, yeah, of course. not here, so we can still discuss. I know that the Haskell folk kind of tried playing with it like 20 years ago. Claimed claim that the contention is usually not a problem. Okay. Uh, as long as we keep it pure as we are supposed to, I, you won't hit any problems with the JSON. It might be extremely performant. And if you hit problems like many, many uh, threads updating on one single reference, really uh, one single variable, STM, STM is probably not a thing to use, mm -hmm. right? Uh, just yeah. go with uh, floating reference or uh, Might be a good go thing. for extreme uh, performance even batching of other things. But th that's a good point that actually the idea, of, as you mentioned, of, uh, of STM, it comes from uh, Haskell. I think that the first paper uh, published on uh, like how to introduce transactional memory, it's uh, implemented in, in Haskell. It's uh, really, really good to read if you're interested in if that. You, if you dig, dig deep down into it, I may be making something up. But from what, what I remember, is like it was in very early Java versions that Haskell copied it from there. The idea in Java DHT as, uh, as not uh, not sustainable, and here we are uh, just a year later implementing it. Yeah, from what I heard, yeah, this Haskell started it, but yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> it, it might be that just the first paper was released for yeah. Haskell. And that it will be the comparison of the per performance mm -hmm. of the test. Ah, okay, mm -hmm. that's the topic for, for the next presentation I'll keep in mind, maybe. <laughs> so <laughs> to give you some benchmarks. And then you could say Haskell team was wrong or they were right. <laughs> Actually, are you aware of any benchmarks? Um, no, no, no. But yeah, that would be interesting mm -hmm. to, to have. <laughs> yeah, I think also that the, the library it, uh, still like needs some love, let's say. Mm -hmm. At least for STM, I think. So STM uh, yeah, has a bit more, at least, uh, convenience wrappers and stuff like that. So it's like also I think nice thing to contribute to. Do you know any bigger projects using STM? No, I was just playing with it um, after hours and like this is the, the result of uh, my experiments but no I haven't uh, but I was shocked that I wasn't aware that something like this exists. I just I've been using like Scala for a couple of years but only this year I like, heard about STM at all so I think that it's something interesting to at least share <laughs> to the people to for them to be aware of maybe mm, then some of them will be able to use it that's that's actually a very good question i i was about to ask the same because for hasco uh for example i mean everyone at some point were super excited about sdm but then you can google some articles about that that they found out that it's very uh, impractical to use and it's a very nice research tool looks cool and sounds fine but then where to use it that's that's the mm -hmm. question so yeah but I, I, if, if any of you know any uh, applications of SDM that are in production not just like this account uh, operations that would be very interesting to talk about Anybody? Yeah, also to add on that, like, I really love how it, like, um, um, frees you of mental load, pre like, related to uh, thinking about uh, handling concurrency. So, uh, yeah, as you saw in the transaction, you don't need to think about <laughs> basically anything. So, I think it might get some tracking, maybe. Right. Ooh. Okay, so thank you, Michal, once again. Uh, for applause, please. <laughs> and now we have time for some more beer. Pizza is already on the way. So, yeah, enjoy, and we'll be back once we are done networking, basically. Okay, welcome back after our break. I hope you enjoyed pizza and beers. These were handpicked by me, so they should be excellent, at least. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to inflate your expectations before the talk or make uh, Wojtek nervous, but I think that's the most important Scala talk you can hear this year, at least so far. <laughs> this decade, we'll see, we'll see, yeah. But yeah, uh, when I first heard it at, uh, out of Scala, I, I just like was like, okay, we need that in Warsaw. Uh, so that's why why Wojtek is here. And yeah, enjoy and also share this talk after uh, our meetup with your uh, colleagues because I think it's gonna be amazing. So to maybe soften the expectations uh, and like encourage Wojtek, uh, round of applause, please. <laughs> Okay, thank you for these very kind words. Uh, hi everyone, I am Wojciech Mazur. I'm, uh, I'm working in Virtus Lab. Uh, in general, I have like a seven years of experience with Scala, but for the last three, more than the last three years, I'm mostly working on the open source. Uh, so uh, I was starting when help with helping for the maintenance of the Scala Native for the Scala Center. I was the, the, their member for like a 
one year and a half. And in the meantime, I'm also like help, helping a bit to our team of the engineers who are working on the Scala compiler with Martin Delsky. Uh, so we like doing the releases of Scala 3, bug fixes, uh, or the like, all the tools like Comity Build, Opel Comity Build, where we, when we uh, try the new version of the compiler against the whole community of these Scala projects and try to find new regressions so you don't have to have them in your code and we are beta testers of new uh, compiler. But uh, today's talk is about this my uh, main area, so the Scala native. And uh, for the long time, uh, that was a project that w had no like this uh, main area where it was, where it could like very, uh, where, where it could be developed or be used frequently, especially in the commercial projects. And there, all there always was that idea that, okay, na compi compilation to native targets. So we get lower mem memory usage, faster startup. Where can you use that? Of course, serverless, because that's a place where uh, low memory footprint and fast startup is the most important. Later, the, de the decent performance, because these, uh, for example, lambda functions that we would have uh, don't need to be like top peak performance, but they should be at least decent. Like, having code that is 10% slower but starts way faster and uses low, lower resources than the others is still good enough. And in fact, I had this idea to make some experiments with that three years ago, uh, but we had some problems ac actually with that. Uh, so the main idea was to deploy some Lambda functions into the uh, AWS, so the most generic solution, so we would uh, Mm, but of course, we, we might later try to think about moving it to some other cloud providers or to a private cloud. Uh, but at that point, it was just the easiest to start with. I made some experiments, but I had some problems. The first one was that we didn't have any dedicated runtime. So when you create a new Lambda handler, for example, in Java or Scala, you use the default JVM uh, runtime which is suited for doing this single job of running JVM programs, and it does it very well. Uh, however, like there's of course other runtimes like Node.js, Python, uh, even Rust runtimes, but there is no dedicated runtime for Scala native, per se. Uh, and even if you would mitigate that, because that's not that very hard, there, uh, there is another problem. If we want to work with AWS or any other cloud uh, provider, our code does not live in the void. Uh, that means that we need to communicate with the other services, we need to communicate with our database, keys, whatever. So we need, need the SDK, Software Dev Development Kit, which is not possible to use on Scala Native because we cannot use Java-based dependencies. All, these, all what Scala Native can run is the code that was compiled with, uh, by Scala Compiler with enabled Scala Native plugin. Uh, however, as you may expect, all those, these things uh, can be done, and that's what we'll be discussing today. So in the first part, we'll talk about this problem of providing the runtime. And this part can easily be, easily be uh, applied to any other language, so Haskell, uh, BrainFuck, any other one, uh, whatever you want, whichever can be run or on a uh, uh, default architecture that is either the X8664 uh, or the ARM64, uh, which are currently only these two are supported by the AWS. Next part, we'll be in the next part, we'll talk about how to make our own SDK uh, if we don't, we don't have that. And in the last part, we would like to take a quick look into the future and what we can do next. But Let's begin with the first topic. So as, as I said previously, uh, in languages like JVM, uh, typically all what you need to do when defining the Lambda handler, for example, for, for AWS, is to just define a single class that would implement the requ request handler interface. And that's the main entry point. And all what you need to do is to provide the fully qualified name to the uh, handler name, so the JVM runtime can just easily start this class and run it. 
Uh, all other, other things are uh, just running um, implicitly. We don't need to define any main method. Uh, the only like uh, needs that you need to do is to ensure that you provide all the required dependencies, also the trans transitive ones. So you need to create, for example, a fat jar and then deploy it to, for example, to S3 from which you can create a new Lambda handler. Uh, when it comes to JS and Python, these are like more like uh, dynamic languages. So the, in that case, you just have a regular function uh, because uh, these languages are not typed, not strongly typed. So you can just pass anywhere and hope that it would not explode. And that's what you typically do. And again, this main method is auto-generated. And as far as, know, as far as I know, you can just provide a list of dependencies that needs to be installed and they will be provided. When it comes to native, uh, under the native, I'm not only talking about Scala native, but also, for example, uh, C, Rust, other languages that are compiled to native code. In that case, uh, in most cases, you would, because these languages, these runtimes, uh, typically don't have, uh, don't, Mm, don't encourage to use reflection. Uh, then you typically would have defined a main, which would start the lambda, lambda runtime internals, or the, like the main loop, which would uh, actually run the lambda handler, or so the, your, your main logic of your code. Uh, so it requires sometimes a bit of boilerplate. And uh, what is important for that is in that case of st static dependencies, you also need to be able to provide these libraries and the runtime. So similarly as the, for the JVM, you just need to provide the bina binaries, the class files, all the dependencies. When it comes to native, uh, you need to provide the exact, or, uh, the also the dependencies, but the native ones, which must fulfill the requirements. So they need to have the same uh, ABI to make them work. Um, which sometimes it's not perfect because in the native world, as we might uh, uh, sometimes uh, see problems that they don't always follow the semantic versioning. Uh, it's very easy to get into cases when we get some dependency hell or are unable to do something. But anyway, in case of all of these runtimes, what's the most important is that all of them are, in case of AWS, are running in the, on the Amazon Linux uh, in the container so there are like uh, sandbox on the environment and they always need to have a one file which is called bootstrap and that's the ultimate entry point which every runtime needs to provide uh, because that's the, the entry point for the Lambda handler or, or rather uh, an entry point for a runtime which would execute the Lambda handler. Uh, so as I said, uh, we need to have this Lambda handler and what it actually does uh, sorry, lambda, uh, lambda handler runtime. Because uh, how these uh, cloud uh, functions work is a bit straightforward. So in general, we have our, in general, our, our, in our infrastructure that works in the cloud, so on the servers of AWS, for example. And they have this internal Lambda service, which is like responsible for starting new uh, new instances of runtimes and, and orchestration of them. Um, but on the R side, uh, so this uh, Lambda service provider bootstraps the uh, instances of a runtime, uh, which are actually uh, responsible for the communication, for the starting of our code uh, and communicating with the outside world, uh, so on the infrastructure of the AWS. And inside of that, we have the actual runtime, which runs our function. Uh, these two components, runtime and function, and the Lambda service, needs to somehow uh, communicate with the outside world, so this execution environment. And so for that, they are using a very simple uh, interface. They just basically just send, uh, use the REST API and send four different messages uh, they have like four different endpoints on which they are saying, hey, I have some event uh, that you can, uh, that you can uh, process. Of course, we start with the uh, request for this event. Uh, Lambda runtime returns event, so the, uh, 
in fact, JSON is typically with information of what to, to, to run. Uh, and this is uh, to, this comes back to the to our runtime with Bootstrap the Lambda handler, so our, our um, uh, business logic which we want to run, and it returns the uh, response to the Lambda, uh, Lambda runtime uh, again. So in general, it doesn't look very difficult to implement, and in fact, it isn't. Uh, what is here is a very simple proof of concept how to make it, how to implement it. So what I use here is just a plain Scala using the Scala toolkit. Uh, so I just use Upico to deserialize and the, and the events and uh, the STTP to connect to the outside world to get these new events. Uh, and that's it, that, that's it. I just run the API, read the event, deserialize it and run through to my Lambda handler. Uh, very simple, isn't it? Uh, yeah, this part is very easy. Uh, but of course, we need some way to uh, make it run. So uh, let's see how we could actually like uh, define the actual application on the full Lambda runtime. So in the previous slide, we have defined this our uh, AWS runtime, which would be uh, started by the Lambda handler, uh, which implemented in here. And what we actually need is we just define the main method. So similarly as in the other native languages, we just bootstrap st starts this loop, uh, which, uh, which just gets the new event and processes it and sends back the response to the AWS. Uh, okay, maybe let's see if that works. So what I have here uh, is the very simple project that is bootstrap using AWS SAM. Uh, SAM stands for serverless application model. And what we have in here is, uh, I don't know if you maybe use Polumi, that might be a bit similar. Uh, we just define our infrastructure or what to run uh, on the AWS. S uh, so we basically define all the resources. And in our case, we would define our Lambda handler called Hello World and some additional stuff that we will need to provide. Uh, we would come back to the internals of that a bit later. And here we have our native function, which is just using a bit of Scala-free syntax, a few braces. Uh, I know that, it's, uh, that it is a bit uh, controversial syntax, but of course, uh, that's my presentation, so, you know. But of course, we have also like another one that is implementing the uh, JVM Lambda handler, so the default one that uh, that would be used on the regular JVM um, architectures. In fact, uh, it's not directly the request handler from the AWS, but just a wrapped, uh, just a wrapped to have like a common API. And okay, so uh, what Sam gives me is the fact that I can actually test my Lambda handlers locally without deploying it to the cloud. And uh, because on the very, my very first presentation, presentation of that, I had I was presenting in the um, place where I had no internet connection and it was a disaster to show anything. Uh, so I actually have already built all my sub projects. They're actually cached by the sum, so I don't need to build them again. And uh, I have two Lambda handlers, as you have seen before, one for the JVM and one for the native. Let's start with the one that is uh, JVM one. So uh, what is happening right now is that Sam is starting the container in which he, he would have exactly the same, uh, the same environment as on the cloud in the AWS uh, servers. So we'd have the same image, for example, and would be able to uh, run exactly the same code. Uh, okay, what do we have here? So we are running our Lambda handler and the stats that we have here is the total time that it took to bootstrap the Lambda handler to start the RJVM and to process the very first event. Uh, that doesn't count the time spent on the boot starting the container. Let's try it once again. Let's see if these times are very similar. And yeah, so again, like almost half a second 
build half a second almost. Uh, just to process a very simple hello world, which just consists of, uh, of parsing JSON and, and uh, returning under one. Of course, normally, uh, uh, lambdas don't stop just after processing, processing first event. So a very subsequent um, event that we processed by the lambda would be much far faster because JVM was already warped up, started, it has class loaded everything. So the next one would take, for, for example, like maybe a three milliseconds. But let's see how the native version of this Lambda handler would work. So again, uh, almost the same code, um, but we are just running them on our own infrastructure. So we have our own runtime, which does not have JVM, and it only has the, our Scala native uh, Lambda handler. So now uh, our cold start was only 30 milliseconds. So even for this very simple use case, uh, at least 10 times less. Let's see if that is repressed, if it is, uh, would be the same. So again, I like uh, 40 milliseconds, so 10 times faster, just for a cold start. So if case when you don't have very much uh, a lot of traffic on the AWS, it would be a lot faster. Okay. Uh, I showed you how the um, Lambda handler looks like. So let's talk about, about the problems. Uh, so in general, uh, what you he see here, this long list is the, uh, all the uh, native dependencies that are required to just run this very simple hello world. Uh, when it comes to having these native libraries, which needs to be provided in the runtime because they are uh, dynamic, uh, they need to ha somehow be present on our Amazon Linux container that will be running somewhere. But the problem is that we don't have control about what will be installed on these containers. They are just provided to us and we need to somehow uh, adapt them. Uh, so in general, we had, we had here like 37 uh, runtime dependencies and there is one big problem uh, shown in the logs below is when uh, it comes from the times when I was trying to uh, build my Lambda handler on my machine, which was using the latest uh, Ubuntu and some latest version of, uh, of C standard library. However, on the Amazon Linux, I was using some version that was published like three years ago and the versions were not matching, of course. Uh, so, I wasn't able to run it. I was able comp to compile my program, but I wasn't able to execute it on the runtime. So how, how have I handled this problem? Uh, the solution is quite simple because I have just assumed that uh, if I need to run my native code, code on some uh, known architecture or some known instances where I know what, what, what where will be installed, let me just uh, let me just create my own container which would replicate this environment. So I have like cre so have created my own Docker container based on the Amazon Linux. I have installed everything that I require to compile my programs. So for example, LLVM IR distribution, but also the uh, Scala CLI to compile my code actually. And but however the so I can this way have a repro reproducible build with the same environment, environment with the same version of the libraries. Uh, all I just need to change or to add is to d make some dirty hack. So I have just uh, took all these native libraries that were missing. I have just copied them from this container and I have extracted them to a one single layer, which would be later linked uh, to all my programs. So I have uh, all these curl SSL libraries and wind, which is used to um, handle stack traces and have just separated it out outside the container. Uh, what is the next step is the definition of my own address resource uh, of my layer, because each Lambda uh, handler, each Lambda function can have some number of attachments to it, uh, which are called layers. And these layers can, for, for example, contain um, jars with dependencies for, uh, in the world of JVM. And in my case, it simply contains the 
uh, all these native uh, dependencies and a bootstrap script. Uh, so as I said earlier, in the very first slides, I, ha I need to have this bootstrap file, which would be linked in the e and would be the entry point for the uh, Lambda handler. Here I just uh, can like control uh, the Aldi library path. If you don't know what it is, it's a path that is used for the native programs to point them where to find, when to look for uh, dynamic dependencies. So they can uh, load them at start startup. Uh, okay. So uh, I have just provided all this stuff and told my runtime to link this uh, layer to all my uh, native functions. So that way, whenever I would start my native Lambda handler, it would also always attach these additional layers with dependencies and make them, uh, make them run. Sorry, okay. Okay, so we have like this very simple hello world case done, but we don't earn money for writing hello worlds and we need to uh, make some business, resolve some problems. Uh, one problem that I have seen and was actually handled a bit by Tapir was handling the HTTP requests. Uh, maybe that's not the most common use case for the Lambda handlers, but I know that this uh, use case is somewhere used. Uh, so I've done it again for the Scala native. The problem is that Tapir does not yet support Scala native, and especially it supports uh, in some modules uh, working with Tapir because it also like uh, supports Cat's effect. However, it does not uh, yet have a published version which, which, uh, which publishes the SDK or the AWS parts of the type Tapir. So uh, I actually ha have uh, made a small contribution or the draft of this contribution and created my own uh, Lambda handler that would be hopefully at some point uh, merged to the Tapir when I would finish it. Uh, but just for the purpose of the demo, I have just published all the uh, all these artifacts locally and uh, build them in my code. And it's just a regular Tapir code, uh, which is uh, quite simple. The only difference I think is this AWS Lambda IO runtime to which I needed to provide some way of starting the application. Uh, so start setting some main inside, uh, inside of it. Mm, which is, I think, not present in the JVM version. Uh, and of course, we probably would like to see if that works. Okay, uh, so as I said earlier, I have built everything by myself earlier, and I have some quite a decent request, uh, HTTP request, that's the uh, type of events that we would see in the AP, API gateway uh, this service that is handled in the AWS for, uh, for the um, API uh, provision. It will contain a lot of data that we might uh, be interested in. And however, we have quite a very simple HTTP handler. Uh, we just uh, listens on a single endpoint, hello, and prints uh, who to grade. So that's a very simple gr uh, greeter example. Uh, known from the ecosystem. And on the Tapir, we just uh, use the same, but on the, but just reference to the uh, implementation from the nat native project. And let's see if that would, what would work uh, as well. Again, let's start with the JVM, because as we know, it, it should be slower, so we can laugh a bit. Okay, so uh, it has started, version with Tapir uh, has started in almost one and a half seconds. Uh, this additional type uh, time from the half a second in the previous example is probably mostly to the class loading and startup of the application, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we are again built for a one, a one and a half second for this very first step. And actually we, I needed to increase the memory size uh, provision to the, to the container because default one is 100 and, uh, 128 megabytes. Uh, however, it was when doubling this value, it, it starts working without add-on memory only at this value. 
so let's compare it with the native version. So there we had one and a half second and 500 megabytes to run a simple handler. And for the native, we have 36, six, 36 milliseconds and much lower memory usage. So that's interesting, good enough, I would say. Uh, of course, all the subsequent, uh, subsequent calls would be faster. I actually have, uh, I think, have a, a demo that I have recorded for my colleagues when they were at the, uh, at the uh, Scala days. Uh, Why I have shown and uh, actually testing it locally. Uh, maybe it would be visible. Yeah, uh, sorry, I mean, let me make it a bit bigger. So AWS also like uh, some also allows to set up the local API that would be able to handle responses. And I have run some 10 subsequent events. And like the average time is like two milliseconds on my local, local, local machine. And the very first one, 100 milliseconds. At that time it was a bit slower, but all these subsequent ones were very fast. Uh, but we don't want to test it locally. And I have another pre-recorded demo that I actually have uh, published my code to the AWS. So uh, when running some, I can just use deploy and it would take all this, my resources that I have uh, predefined and would build them and publish on the AWS and make them run. Of course, in the meantime, some additional stuff uh, that would be required, some, some roles, some permissions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It might take a while, so maybe if I, uh, I'm, I, I am able, I can maybe just forward it a bit. No, that's not, not, that's not this button. Uh, so in the meantime, it is probably deploying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, you can see how, how much it takes to deploy some very simple application to AWS using SAM. Uh, and it, the part that we see here is basically only uh, bootstrapping things on, on the cloud. Uh, so it's mostly the time spent outside of our machine. And there is a bit of more of this uh, stuff, but luckily uh, we'll be able to see that it was actually the wall stack was created on the bottom in here. Um, I have just copied the path to the Lambda handler and I have tried to test it locally and it works decently. Of course, the connection was not very fast. Uh, yeah. Okay, so right now we have two problems solved. Uh, one was how to uh, make the runtime work. The second one uh, was uh, how to improve it a bit. However, uh, as I said, our code does not leak the void. If you have our HP handler, we still need, for example, connection to the uh, database. So we need the SDK. And that's the funny part, because as I said, we don't have one and we need to build our own one with cuts and effects, because I know that most of you like these technologies. So, uh, because, so when I was trying this for the first time, like three years ago, and there I have seen that AWS was defining all their services using this funny format called Smithy, which looks like on this slide on the left, uh, a bit similar to gRPC, but that's not very important. However, at that time I had a lot of other problems. I wanted to do it to, in my free time, create some code that would generate a Scala, pure Scala code uh, based on these predefinitions that I, uh, of course, had other things to do. So instead, I have just waited. And I think around, around a year ago, uh, the Disney streaming has announced that they have created a tool called Smith4S, which is uh, able to generate a pure Scala code based on the, tag, uh, on the type level stack and create uh, a very good, decent clients involving most uh, large part of the AWS uh, um, services. With that in mind, uh, we can actually uh, generate both models, like in the par part uh, here, um, as well as the actual, actual um, services and clients for them. Uh, okay, 
So in here, based on this uh, code generated in here, uh, previously from this um, Smithy schema, I am able to create a new client, uh, in that case by using the Ember uh, client and server, um, create my own HTTP client, which would wrap the service, and it would expose um, the fully fledged client, which can be used to communicate via this uh, established API or the established uh, schema. And as well, I can do it for the uh, server, server side as well. And all of that is working uh, quite decently on this scale native because all of this code does, ha does not have any Java dependencies and it would just um, generate everything that I need. And there was only one thing that I needed to do because there was there, there at that time there was some clash with the uh, with the um, uh, with usage of the default um, execution runtime provided by Cadas Effect. So I needed to, to replace it with my own one, uh, or rather uh, the implementation of the Arman Bilge, which is a guy who is uh, resp responsible for migrating mo mo most of the type level slack to this scale native. So he knows what he's doing. And, uh, but how do I actually get the schema for the AWS services? Uh, again, Smithy, uh, Disney Streaming comes to the rescue because they had some ways of obtaining them because by default, AWS does not expose the schema for their, their, their APIs but they have managed to somehow get them and to make them public. So all what you need to do is to just run a Smith4S, generate uh, the path to the jar, which is published on the Maven, containing the specification for the Smith format and some output directory to which the code will be generated. Uh, in my case, uh, I had a use case when I wanted to, create to connect to the DynamoDB just to record some events. Uh, so it, I uh, it just took the specification and it created uh, almost a 1,000 files uh, describing the whole uh, schema, and, and it was in fact ready to use. Uh, I wouldn't have demo for, for this one because uh, just before the talk, I have seen that it is broken for some reason. It wasn't maintained uh, since, since the last uh, preview of this talk. And so sorry for that. However, you have to believe me that it just worked and. Uh, somebody who is not aware might not even see that what we define here is the usage of the this custom DynamoDB client and not the default one coming from uh, AWS SDK, which is using the, the builder pattern in here, uh, but, it's, it, but it is maybe a bit cleaner, maybe not, who knows. So anyway, all that I needed to do is to create uh, my own HTTP client, attach the uh, attach it to the DynamoDB, which would create the actual client with backed with this uh, with this HTTP part, uh, give some credentials from the environment, and it just works uh, just fine. And I said uh, I wouldn't we wouldn't have a demo for this one, but in this example we had a very simple static application which was like uh, published in the using the Amplify use the Cognito modu module for uh, authentication, Amazon API Gateway, uh, which was direct, uh, which, mm, so the Amazon API Gateway was this module that was exposing the API to the public world, and it was forwarding all the traffic to AWS Lambda, which was later communicating with, the, with DynamoDB. Uh, so, uh, and all of this was just, uh, redoing a very simple workshop um, that we can find somewhere on the AWS. They have a bunch of them and it just uh, just worked. And the full program of that, which is actually unfortunately not published, is here. So it's uh, just a regular Scala code, some R model for, because the application, I, I forget to say about the context. In our application, we just were uh, a company providing the unicorns and delivering them to the clients. Uh, so we just needed to um, take the uh, the order for for our uh, for our uh, fairy animal, um, return um, one of the available ones to the client, log uh, this event in the database, and that's it. 
And uh, what do we had here was, as I said earlier, uh, earlier mm, one hack that is still required uh, using this cu custom EPOR runtime instead of the default ones be because the default uh, cuts effect runtime for Scala native might block. And that's a problem. Uh, I don't really know uh, why it happens, but it happens. And uh, until we would have a Scala native next major version of Scala native, which comes with the multi fully fledged multi threading, uh, we would need to have some workarounds for now. And, uh, and yeah, and the main logic, just a typical code, which could be like written on JVM or whatever. And the main communication with Tiny and NemoDB, just a silly function. I know that you're, uh, some of you are, are functional programming purists, so don't hate me. I'm just doing this the show. So uh, and that's it. So uh, at this moment, we are able to have the native runtime. We are able to create the AWS SDK. Uh, so what's left from the actual adoption of this kind of in the serverless? Because as you have seen, uh, that's just a POC. Uh, nobody would use it, use it uh, in the Scala shop and deploy uh, because it's not stable enough. So the first thing, speaking uh, for us, so as you have seen, we are generating the stuff from the schema provided. Uh, we have all the schemas right now for the AWS services, but we cannot actually generate um, valid clients for all of them because AWS uses something called protocols. And different protocols are used for uh, different types of services. For example, REST XML is used for uh, S3, if I remember correctly. Uh, so uh, at that point, many of the services are not uh, reachable for us. However, all of these uh, are currently, um, are going to be implemented soon. They are all assigned to the next uh, minor release of, of Smith for us. So hopefully it will be fixed um, quite soon. Um, however, there are other problems. Uh, so on this cognitive part, um, we need actually do some very st stable runtime, which would be a v much more uh, viable, which would extract more information from this context. One thing I, that I forget to say is that uh, the context in which the, Scala, the Lambda handler is executing, executing is past the uh, uh, HTML headers, HTTP headers. So you can just extract this information, uh, but some parts might not uh, work yet correctly, like for example, getting some uh, logger for our event from the context. Um, however, uh, because Scala uh, partially supports the reflection, we can uh, have uh, something that is not possible, for example, in the, real, uh, in the Rust, for example, to have a reflection-based native application. So we would define our Lambda, so we could potentially have multiple Lambda handlers in a one binary and just select which one we would, do, would we like to, to run, maybe for A-B testing, I don't know. Uh, other problems, uh, tooling support. Uh, so some, some, some is nice, but it's not very uh, good for working in the, uh, with the Scala at this point, mostly because we need to generate these make files. Uh, make files, yeah, because um, what we have seen were the templates which were describing the overlay, uh, the overall um, infrastructure, I would say. However, the actual building of the code uh, is handled by the uh, make files which map one to one with each resource. So we have uh, Scalantive Runtime and we have make file entry we've built and this name. And all the everything is built in the uh, Scala key. However, right now uh, we make some experiments uh, with the Polumi and we'd like to maybe streamline some things a bit uh, more, make them more approachable and actually um, make things uh, easy to deploy, easy to, 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 to work with, uh, especially maybe via combination of uh, JVM runtimes, which are very fast to, they give a very fast feedback loop because you can test it very quickly. And the native runtimes, which can be longer, which 
take longer to build, uh, but uh, would have better performance characteristics of the runtime characteristics. Uh, there are problems. Uh, resolving ver vendor locking. That's not a very big issue because at some point we, of course, would move out of the AWS and try to do the same for the other uh, cloud providers. But of course, at that point, uh, we are stuck with AWS because it's the easiest one to, to work with at this moment. Uh, I know that for the Google Cloud, they are mostly us using gRPC. And I think I have seen one very early prototype of um, pure Scala um, Smith P4S replacement. So each one would also take the uh, schema and would produce a pure Scala code, uh, which would not depend on the uh, Java dependencies. I don't really know what, what is needed for a Azure. Uh, what's more, of course, later we would like to, to target the some uh, private cloud solutions like uh, Keynative, but again, I'm not a uh, cloud data guy and I don't really have yet much uh, knowledge in these areas. And last but not least, uh, this kind of itself, because uh, for example, a faster incremental builds would be uh, really necessary for that, as well as smaller, build, uh, smaller binaries, so uh, we can start more of this code uh, or deploy them a bit faster. And in fact, uh, that's all that, he re that I really had for today's meeting. Uh, if you had any questions, I'm open. And of course, we can talk also later uh, after the talk. Uh, we have beer or something. So, thank you. Yeah, so uh, right now, when it comes to stuff like Cats Effects or Zillow, uh, which, let's be honest, the, the main purpose is to have a safe mal con concurrency, is one of the goals. Uh, having a single threaded uh, runtime, in some cases, is a, is a bit of a blocker. You need to know a bit more about the current internals of Scala Native, because under the hood, we have this uh, single. Uh, mm, single runnable, uh, sim sim very simple qui based execution context. Uh, so we can somehow use that, but there are still blockers. For example, in the case of cuts effect, uh, we don't have currently um, the API for the cuts effects currently differs uh, from the one provided for the JVM. Uh, that's because, for example, we don't have timers, uh, actually, or at least they are not um, Available in the native in the native uh, binaries, so we don't have run and save sync method. Uh, instead, we need to use the async one, uh, but in some cases that might be problematic. For example, if we want to experiment or whatever. In general, uh, I'm in, I'm in a contact with one of the guys from the type level. I know uh, right now that they have a free more. Uh, Java classes that are not yet ported and not available. Uh, but after that, I guess that the, their uh, adaption to the native might be way faster than currently uh, because they would have all the missing pieces from the uh, Java standard library. So they would have uh, all these logs that are somewhere needed if they don't replant them by themselves uh, or interfaces that might be uh, needed and to reduce the amount of the code duplicates because if currently if they need some Java classes from the Java standard library and if they are not yet implemented in Scala Native, they typically would uh, mock them on their site, for example, or, or re-implement. Re so that's not a very per perfect solution. For other ones, like Zio, I don't really know. I don't think they are target going to target native, or at least I haven't heard about, about this one. But we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Have you tried or seen uh, uh, the usage of uh, Scala JS of the similar? Uh, 
I, I, I haven't, but I know that Tucker guys did um, because they have the AWS module for uh, uh, for Scala.js and they were actually uh, building JS applications for using the Scala.js and in their use case it was faster to start. Uh, so uh, I haven't done it, done it myself, uh, but they did. How quicker is that? Uh, I don't remember the exact numbers. I don't want to 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 to, uh, to to lie here. I think that it was like a ten times because uh, JS frontends are typically faster to start, and that's the the, thing, the thing that is, that is the most, the most important. Uh, I haven't made tests, so I cannot like uh, be really reliable source of, of information. Uh, but I think it was like a ten, ten times fold. Uh, I think. There is some comments in that on their documentation somewhere, but I would need to find it. Sorry. Thank you. Is this uh, static type project that you show um, like cross -com cross compile compatible? Like you have this one code base and it generates well JVM and native code? Uh, okay, so uh, you're talking about this my template where I have just uh, have. At one project, I had the same code for native and JVM. In this example, yeah. So in that case, I will have just used a bit of uh, Scala Cliff because all my hand Lambda handlers are defined in uh, subdirectories. However, for the uh, sorry, not this one. Uh, for some of the sources, I explicitly say that they are only for the JVM. Other uh, other ones are only available on the native, uh, like this one. Um, and uh, when I actually try to build my application, uh, I, uh, when I pass the target that I want to target, so in case of native, I would only compile the sources that are directed to the native. And because I don't have like a fully fledged build like SBT one, I just pass the uh, directories that, I, that I'm actually interested in compiling. So uh, I pass the main class. Uh, sorry, was that this one? Yeah, so I, I'm just passing the some, only some files uh, without the fully fledged build tool that which, which would like um, create dedicated targets for each of them. Uh, so it's a bit of hacking uh, with, uh, with this uh, with this, uh, with Scala Clean. Yeah. And for the JVM, I was just using the regular compilation, just doing the, the other thing, other way, just pointing that it should just take the JVM compliant files, um, and that's it. And just in case of native, uh, I was just doing everything in, in the inside the container. So all these commands are executed uh, in the Docker, and that's it. Okay, if there are like no other questions, you can catch me later. Uh, and I think that would be everything. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Wojtek. <coughs> thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, once again, thank you to our lovely speakers, to our sponsors for making it happen. I also would like to thank you for drinking all the beers and eating all the pizza. I think it's the first time we've actually managed to do that. Well, there are a couple of non-alcoholic beers, but let's be honest. <laughs> uh, you can grab some to go also, because the, the way to, to some more alcoholic beers is like 10 minutes probably. Uh, that's Przemek over there. He will lead the way if you cannot navigate using Google Maps. Uh, and yeah, uh, we'll, see, we'll see you there. Uh, as for vacation or summertime, we have planned, as usual, beach party, probably in July or August. You, you, I will let you know on Meetup or on Twitter. And also maybe like a barbecue or something. It will be fun. Uh, don't worry. And we'll be back with the usual uh, presentations in September, probably. There's like... A Scala days in September, which will probably make everyone busy, but we'll try to figure it out. So thank you very much, and I hope to see you either by the barbecue or on the beach. <laughs>